Good evening and welcome to the Selena Scott Show. My first guest tonight has been labelled the Peter Pan of pop. He hates the phrase, but how else can you describe a man who's rarely been out of the charts in 40 years and seems to have barely aged since his first hit back in 1959? He's now 55 years old. Cliff Richard, or Sir Cliff Richard to give him his proper title, shows no signs of retiring. In fact, today sees the release of his new album. It's called Songs from Heathcliff. I'll be talking to Cliff in just a moment, but first let's take a look at his long and distinguished career. I recall all of that. I mean, every bit of it. So I do I. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you do, because it's, uh, it's been so long. It's been right from the very beginning. Do you recall right from the very beginning, right up until you know, it all happened for you? Yes, I mean, it's still quite vivid, even before the beginning, because the, the, almost the most important part was is, it was getting the burning ambition going and all of that and uh, it was Elvis I have to thank for that because he's the one that really inspired me to try and be well what he was of course you know I realized over the years that none of us were ever going to be like Elvis mm -hmm. he really was a one-off but uh, nevertheless he inspired hundreds and thousands of us maybe to try and I was one of the lucky ones that actually made it and I can remember those years being at school forming a little band in school playing in the local pubs and clubs coming into London failing um, you know, and, and then having it happen, meeting the wonderful Norrie Paramore, who was producer of my records for nearly 15 years. He gave me 15 years of uninterrupted top 10 hits. Luck as well, as well as talent. It, you always need some of that. Mm -hmm. You never met Elvis, although you had an opportunity to go and meet him, and you turned him down, is that right? Well, I didn't turn him down, but I turned the offer down. Mm. Uh, I was in the States promoting Devil Woman, and uh, it's one of the few really big hits I've had there. And a, a journalist said to me, you know, I know Elvis, and I know you're a big fan. Would you like to meet him? And at that stage, remember Elvis went through a very rather grotesque stage. I don't know what, what had caused it, but he was very, very overweight. And my, my memory of Elvis is still intact, though. I feel that's one thing good about not having met him. The animal that inspired me was not this fat man. And so I said, look, no, I'll wait. Because Elvis used to go on diets and then look great again. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I'll wait till he's kind of got himself together, and then I'd like to meet him. And of course, unfortunately for me, I mean, what, two or three years later, Elvis had died, and I, and I feel now, although my memories are intact, I still wish I'd met the man. When you were going through all of that, uh, learning to sing and putting all the energy into it all, did anyone say to you, look, you know, you're wasting your time, uh, the, the, the life is going to be hell, the money is never going to come, you're going to waste <laughs> your life trying to, to do this deal? Um, no, they didn't, because you have to remember that when it happened to me, it happened really quickly. I left school when I was 16 and a half years old. By the time I was 17 and a half, I'd already made my first record. And I was on tour, and my record was number two in the charts when I was in Leicester, De Montfort Hall, and I turned 18. So there hadn't been really enough time. If I'd been hacking around till I was 22 or something like that, people might then have had the chance to say, look, you know, are you doing the right thing here now? Are you going to really make it? And even now, when people ask me for advice, I always say, look, you know, go for it if you really want to do something like this. But give yourself a, a time, say three years, four years. If I haven't made it in four years, I'm going to assume that even though I think I'm terrific, <laughs> no one else does, and so therefore I'll get on with my life. Uh, but it didn't have, happen to me. It happened really fast and quickly. You said I'd forgotten quickly. all about that. Yeah, You're right, it did, didn't it? Yes, the I excitement mean, must, have been ge must have generated so much more in you to go on and to, and well, to, to do what you do. It was like, it, it was a total dream sequence because it seemed to me that just the day before I'd been in school with my friends all trying to look like Elvis and having the girls <laughs> serve as extra helpings of pudding because they thought we were really dishy guys. Uh, and the next thing, I was on stage. I mean, I, there was only a year and a half gap, that's all, from the time I left school and the time I was actually touring for the first time and doing shows like Oh Boy with Jack Good, such an innovator. Um, it, it was, there was no time at all, really. And it was, it was really a fantastic time. That's where the luck comes in, I suppose. I mean, I suppose I had to have something to capitalize on the luck, but you still need that little stroke that lets you meet the right people, that lets you meet Nori Paramore, that lets N Nori Paramore have an empty space in his schedule, also an empty space on his books. He did not have a rock star, and he wanted one, a pop star. Any pop star would do, I've got a feeling. No, and no. I mean, you, no, come on. Well, I mean, <laughs> in, the sp in the space of time that you, you know, made it, all these screaming girls, all these these girls all over were there to greet you. I mean, it, it didn't take any fool to sort of notice that you had something else besides talent. Well, maybe, the, maybe the that's what. Maybe well, maybe that's what Nori had. His big offering probably was to spot something that was, in fact, embedded there. But when I see early videos and and listen to early records, I often wonder how I really 
made it. You know, I kept thinking to myself, maybe the competition was really bad over here. No, you were so because exotic. I remember you being so exotic. I remember as a girl in school reading about the siege of Lucknow, something like 1856 or something <laughs> like that. And then you came along, and there you were. You'd been born in Lucknow, like, no, <laughs> India. You had all well, of this background. Yeah, maybe, well. maybe that all does add Certainly. to the sort of mystique of it all. Me, I, must tell you that. I mean, being born in India and sort of coming out and saying that, I suppose. I never thought of it in those terms before. What about money? Uh, I mean, your background it was, was fairly poor, yeah. wasn't it? You, lived, you were born in Lucknow, yes, but you stayed there till you were eight years old. Well, Lucknow, I left when, we were, when I was really young. I stayed in India till I was eight years yes. old. Um, and that was not a bad time of my life because my father had a job where everything was given to him. The home we had was pres presented to him by the company. He didn't own it, mind you, which was the problem when we left, of course. By ha having a situation where everything was paid for, the food, the people that worked for my father, the home that we lived in. What did you do, your father? My father was in catering. He, he was a, a district manager of a catering company called Kellner's, and he used to go to all the railway stations where the, where the railway stations had food served, and it was from his company that delivered the food. And so, it, so we didn't pay for food either. The trouble was that when we decided to leave in 1948, we also had no money because my father had nothing to sell. So once he'd sold a few goods and chattels that he owned, um, we arrived in England. My father, we then had, there were two sisters and myself, my fourth, my third sister was born here, um, and, a, and a wife and my father. There were five of us and we had five pounds sterling when we arrived. So that's when we really began to know what poverty was like. And if it hadn't been for my grandmother and then later an aunt, uh, I'm not sure what we'd have done. And they call you Cliff, don't they, your family? They yes. don't call you Harry, which no, is no. your real name. It seems no. weird, doesn't it's, it? It's well, it is weird, but uh, again, I don't know what it was. I came home the day I chose the name and just said to my family, look, I've changed my name. And they said, what is it? And I said, it's Cliff Richard. They went, all right, Cliff. And the only one that had difficulty was my youngest sister, Joan. Jackie and Donna were really good with it. Joan, because when I was 18, she was only eight. Uh, and every now and then she'd go, Harry, oops, <laughs> as though it was some great terrible sort of sin to call me Harry. And from the word go, they called me Cliff, and uh, they've never referred to me as anything else. And when we've talked about it now, they say, the strange thing is, they said, you don't look like a Harry to us. Isn't that funny? I've, I've become Cliff, and in fact, I am now. I changed my name by deed poll. Um, I, I am Cliff Richard now. I see. So, the money thing again. Did you have to make money for your family? Even though you were, how old were you, 18 years 18, old? Yes. Yeah. Were you going out and making money for your family, to look after your family? So it was a motivating force in yes, your career at the very beginning? Oh, there's no doubt about it. It's no good us pretending that money doesn't change us. I mean, I went th through a lot of interviews saying that money hasn't changed me. But then, again, as you get older, you realise that money is something that we all, it's a necessity of life now. And uh, I realised that, that we were poor. Although, funnily enough, my sisters and I have talked about this, and being poor does not equal unhappiness. I mean, okay, I think it's better to be rich than poor, but we were really poor, and yet my sisters and I talk regularly, and we say, can you remember being unhappy as a child? And the answer is no, we weren't unhappy as children. So somehow or another, that generation of parents was able to deal with being poor and bringing up four children, as in our case, and making us feel as though we were the most important things in everybody's lives. The other problem, of course, is that if you were brought up in a poor background, and money counts for everything. It becomes harder and harder to spend it as you make more and more of it later on because you find that you don't need the things that other people have got. Or maybe you think, I, can I afford it? Can I do yep. this? Will I, ever be, will I ever be poor again? Won't I need my money at a later uh, to stage? To save it. Well, it's funny you should say that because it must be the fact that we went through this period uh, of really terrible uh, poverty that uh, nowadays, for instance, I really I, I mean, I know I can afford so much now, and I do have so much, and I can spend money quite easily. But, it, but every time I do, I mean, I can tell you now, I mean, I went into a very famous designer name shop to buy suits. They didn't have the suits I wanted, so I thought, I, I felt slightly embarrassed. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll just buy this shirt, and it was a beautiful colored shirt. They come out with a colored shirt every now and then. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'll take one of the shirts anyway, thank you very much. And they got me out seven shirts, I chose the color and pattern, and then while they put the six away, I turned it over, and it had 950 pounds written on the back. And I thought, do you know, I couldn't buy it. I said, look, I'm really sorry, <laughs> but my mum would kill me <laughs> if I spent 950 pounds on a shirt. Now I can afford that. And in fact, the man was a bit rude. He said, well, uh, he said, we don't give them away, sir. And I said, well, I don't buy them at this price. <laughs> and then that day I saw a Mercedes, a secondhand Mercedes with 11,000 miles on the clock and it had 54,000 pounds on it. And I thought 54 of those shirts would equal this Mercedes and I'd rather have the Mercedes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so how many cars have you got? I've got three. Right, so what's I, the other two? The, I have a Rolls, uh, yeah. Telelite's a Bentley. 
the one you just Bentley, bought. The one I just bought mm. the Bentley. Uh, and then I have uh, a Mercedes 500 SL, which I bought for myself on my 50th birthday. I thought no one's going to buy me one yeah. of those. Mm -hmm. um, and a uh, Range Rover. How you get time to drive them is the next thing, isn't it? With all this work you're doing, all this travelling you're doing. That is the problem. Being at home is really hard to find the time to be at home. Mm. Uh, this, this autumn is full of all my... Uh, it's all promotional work for the new, new album and singles. And uh, being at home is really hard. It's so, so driving is difficult. I get driven around most of the time. But when I do, I do like to drive myself. As a rule, I, if I was coming socially into town, I wouldn't uh, get a car hire. I would, um, I would drive myself. Do you drive fast? Are you, are you kind of a bad driver in that way? No, I'm not, actually. I found that since I started owning big cars like a Rolls-Royce and the Bentley now, I have no desire to drive fast. In the Range Rover, it's not really a fast car. Now, the Mercedes, I have driven fast, um, but I've given up the idea. Since I know that over 100 miles an hour, you lose your license, I think it's, a, it's confiscated immediately, mm -hmm. I thought to myself, is it really worth the thing? And I, and I realized it's not really. So I... I, I just say to myself, well, in my Mercedes, I'm the first to 60 when it's leaving the traffic lights, and as long as I stay within that, I'm, I'm safe. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the worst thing, isn't it, if you're Sir Cliff Richard, you know, and you're stopped by the police and you have to produce your driving license and all the rest of it, and it's all this awfulness of... <laughs> that's oh. right, and of course it's worse for people like us, because they, perhaps the, the journalists would love to have wouldn't, stories like that. Wouldn't yes. they just, being naughty. Particularly if you've had perhaps more wine than you should have done. This is true. Let's take a break, Cliff. We'll be back in a minute. I'll be con uh, continuing my conversation with Cliff, so don't go away. Uh, stay with us. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, I'm speaking to Sir Cliff Richard. We've been waiting for you to return because we want to listen to his latest single. It's from his new album, Songs of Heathcliff. Songs from Heathcliff, and it's called Misunderstood Man. Yes, yes. Who wrote it? It's written by Tim Rice, did the lyrics for the whole of the album, uh, the show, in fact, and uh, a man called John Farrer. I mean, uh, often people say, Who's John Farrer? He is the guy that gave all of Olivia Newton John her biggest hits. He wrote and produced them. And uh, I really think he's a uh, a massive secret that the world is going to meet now because uh, he's written sensitive uh, pop rock music with integrity and that's what I wanted really. I didn't want to go into the sort of classical mold because I can't sing that kind of music and I wanted to do a musical that, that actually represented uh, the kind of music I love and the, the, the kind of music a lot of fans like too. It's called Misunderstood Man. Mm. Uh, do, you, do you ever reckon that you have in your own little way been misunderstood in Britain? Oh, and you know, because all the time. The, because the press seem to have this thing about your single status, don't they? Yeah, but I think it's inevitable that we're all of us misunderstood because none of us actually share everything about ourselves anyway. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's funny, I find it rather naive that journalism actually believes that when they ask questions, they're going to get all the answers. I mean, because no one does. There are certain parts of your life that you don't want to talk about, and, and I don't. Uh, even from my closest friends, you don't... You, I, but maybe it's a fault that we all have flaw in our, in our personalities, but we tend not to give everything away. Mm. And so when it comes to being exposed to the public via journalism, even more is kept back. So, and because you keep it back, and therefore it's partly my fault, you are misunderstood. Because people start to speculate then, and the speculation is really dangerous. But do, uh, do you feel, because you've been in the business for so long, that you can't ever be naughty? I mean, even if you, uh, you know, were a naughty person, you could never, ever exhibit any tendency to either drink or drive too fast or well, do things that most other guys do because you're always, always in the public spotlight. Yes, I mean, that is a terrible pressure, and particularly since I became a Christian. I mean, then, then the pressure was really on because you get the feeling that if you did anything wrong, they go say, huh, and this guy calls himself a Christian. It's like all those terrible things that happen in the States with all the TV, uh, the gospel holy rollers, you know. They came out with a holier-than-thou attitude and then fell in front of everybody. Instead of people saying, he's just another human, they say, huh, and this guy says he's a Christian. It's an immediate, terrible put down, not only to you, but to Christianity, which is what frightens me more than anything else. I keep saying to people, I am only human. I am not perfect. If I'm presented as perfection, ignore it. It is totally wrong. And if, if I come out as a, as a goody two-shoes, I've at least been successful in hiding the baddie parts of me. And I don't want to share the bad parts of me because they're of no value to anybody. Why did you come out and say, I'm a Christian, when you knew the risk you were running, when you knew you'd have to be even better than you were before? I feel, I mean, it's a good question, because I feel it was a point in my life when I really started to grow up. Um, I had to decide, did I really believe this? And if I did, 
does my career really man ma matter compared to it? And so therefore, you're, you're right, I did think about whether or not this was going to damage my career. And uh, when I decided that it might, I then had to decide, well, am I going to go public with it? And I decided to go public and I thought, that's it. Now I know where my priorities are. Because I am prepared to lose this fantastic career and all this money and fame for the sake of what I believe, at least I know that it's true for me. Mm -hmm. it, gave, it gave your career a boost as well. It but you did, could, actually, you could but have just kept quiet. What I'm saying, you could have kept quiet and been a Christian and done what you needed to do done, and yeah. gone to church and talked to your friends and talked to people and not really bothered about it. Yeah, but the funny thing is, when I first came out publicly, of course, I was scorned. Uh, all the press were at the Billy Graham thing in 1966. He asked me to come and speak. He'd heard that I was a Christian and said, would you be prepared to come and speak on the Thursday night? There'll be a lot of young people in, and you're a pop star and everything and they'd love to hear that you're a Christian. So I got, I got up and did it. And on the front bit where mostly people come and stand when Billy Graham makes this appeal for them to come and convert themselves to Christianity through Jesus, um, there were all these press people. Well, I mean, the press weren't very nice to me. I mean, it was all derogatory and very cynical and huh, here's another, you know, uh, religious nutcase and all of this went on. And, but it didn't damage my career. And in the end, now I look back on it, in fact, it was fantastic for my career because it laid me wide open to the public. And I think the public quite like vulnerable people because they know that's what we are. And in the end, all of us that are alive on the planet, we're all so vulnerable to each other, to what people think of us, to what we do, you know, everything is there. And so for me to have become vulnerable in front of them was fantastic. And although I thought that I could lose my fans, that year, that was in, a, I think that was in July of 66, I appeared in the pantomime at the Palladium that year, Christmas 66, and we broke all box office records known to the Palladium at that time. It's been broken again since then, of course. And so I thought, oh, mm -hmm. I don't think it's directly because of my being a Christian. It's directly because of being a man in front of everyone. It's, it's like when you read, when Elton came out and said, I'm, a, I'm an alcoholic. It's when the Beatles came out and said, we take drugs. If you're honest, I'm not applauding the fact that we are bad, and that's the thing I'm always fighting. In point of fact, what we should be saying is, you shouldn't be a drug addict, you shouldn't be an alcoholic. Although an alco alcoholism is difficult, because that's more of an illness. I mean, I've come to re recognize that some people are born alcoholics. There's a kind of broken down gene and there's no control over their lives. But what's fantastic is that Elton comes out and fights it in front of everyone. Roy Castle is loved more than ever before because he died in front of us. How vulnerable can you get? And he fought it, and people liked the fight. So my fight's not over yet, but at that stage, I was battling against all the things that were being said about me publicly, and, and I still have to battle, uh, so, but not as hard, I guess, now. The trouble is, you see, it's the way you look, isn't it? It's the fact that you look like you look, you haven't got a, a woman, it seems, in your life, and the, they therefore want to label you in some way, and so that's, that's where it all comes through. Now, you come out and said you're a Christian. You could have just as easily have gone, out, gone away and said, well, okay, I'm going to get married to this woman. Any woman yeah. would have married you. Anyone you really wanted would have married you. Yeah. And yet you chose not to go down that route. I chose to, not to go to down that route at least waters. three times. I mean, uh, I, just when I gave myself the go-ahead, I felt I couldn't be married. I didn't want to be married. If I'd got married to any of the three women that I thought of marrying, uh, I would like to think that it would have lasted, although would it? I did make three choices. Mm -hmm. I made three choices. I mean, it, as though it had nothing to do with them, and of course it had lots to do with them. Um, but, but maybe it wouldn't have lasted. But if it had lasted, my career would be different. I know that because I, I'm definitely a person that commits himself to something. I commit myself to projects now, whether it be Heathcliff or whether it be a show I did two years ago or something I'm planning to do in five years' time. If it was marriage, I would commit myself to that other person. And if they were children, there is no way I would trot around the globe the way I do now. You see these guys going off on a Saturday morning with their kids, you know, as born-again fathers, taking the responsibility of, 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 of motherhood off, off their wives. And, uh, and I'm sure you see them as well. Do you never feel, uh, you know, a kind of a tug? A, a, a feeling that you, children know, you, are you different. could, you could if you wanted, but... Uh, yeah, but children are different. I mean, I... To me, uh, children are not the reason to get married. You know, children come out of a, a, the union of two people who love each other, and then their love is divided and split towards this other, this, suddenly this third being. Uh, and, and that's the reason to have children. Uh, I, I don't want to look at children and say, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have children, and go off and father a child. It, it, to me, it's the wrong way round. Where does the philosophy come from with you? You think yes. your parents, you think it's your, your childhood think it's my, or upbringing? I think it starts with the parents. My parents gave me a feeling towards life that I should aim at success but be prepared to fail. 
and that life would have to continue. Then when Christianity came into it, it just linked in with all the things they taught but me. But before we get to Christianity, if you had a, such a secure, and it sounds a very happy childhood, mm. what was the reason for you getting involved in Christianity and religion? Because it's, it, you think of people turning to God when they've gone through a tremendous trauma in their lives, some awful thing that they can't somehow come to terms with, and they, they turn to the thing yes. that they find the truest. Well, with you, you were, you were successful, you had money, you had friends, you had everything you could possibly want. It seemed as though you had nothing left. I know, and that's why my story is not as good as hearing it from someone who has some great tragedy in their lives and can relate that tragedy and say how they came through it because God became part of their lives. Uh, my, my story is less dramatic. But I think it's just as valid because of all the things you quoted. Why is it that someone who is rich and famous and is adored by people, why is it that I felt a need for God in my life? And the fact of the matter is I don't know why other than when it came down to uh, after show dinners with the shadows, after touring or whatever, or being on the coach for hours on end, we talk about sex, religion and politics. Not necessarily in that order, but more and more I found religion was coming in. I suppose as you get older you do, the reason for being here, why are we on this planet, etc., all that came in. And the more religion came in, and this is where my parents come in, they, I, they had a faith, a basic simple faith, and that had never died in me. I was never an atheist, but I was uh, not a Christian, because I had kind of pushed it all back, so okay, well, I know there's a God, but he's got nothing to do with me, he's up there and I'm down here, I shall live my life as best I can. But the more and more I talked about it, the more I thought about it, it seemed to me that there was a void that nothing seemed to fill. My career was not making me hysterically happy. I was n not unhappy, not depressed, but it didn't, I didn't feel what I felt I should have felt. When I first wanted to become a singer, I thought, this is going to be the answer to everything, not just my financial status, but that I am going to feel 100% a person. And I wasn't feeling it. And, uh, and we all go through that, suddenly thinking, well, why am I? Yes, rock and roll's nice, but Okay, is that the end of it? Is that everything in life? Is that all that I'm ever going to do and offer the world? No, it can't be that. And the more I thought of it, the more religion came in. And again, because of my parents, uh, it, it, it had already instilled the, the fact, the possibility of God. And so I chased that. And I read up on, in the New Testament. I read books about it. I spoke with Jewish people, with Jehovah's Witnesses, with just Orthodox Christians. And finally, came to this understanding of, of Jesus and his existence and the part he could play in my life if I was prepared to hand it over. And that's the hard part. Mm -hmm. That's the part that's really difficult, I think, because none of us are really humble. I mean, how can I be really humble when already I think my album is the best thing I've ever made and better than anything I've heard in 10 years? So there's a contradiction there, um, and somehow I have to balance it. The passion of still there, enjoying the music, enjoying what the music brings. Yeah, well, it's, it's still there. It is. <laughs> and it's going to be there for many, presumably many years to come. Well, I hope so. I mean, people keep asking me about retirement and things, and I'm getting to that age, 55, when I think, well, I could genuinely retire now, having done a lot and offered a lot to my art form, um, knowing full well, of course, that no one ever does it perfectly, and not everybody likes you anyway, but uh, I've done my piece. You, you see I yourself on the video and you can't back off. Uh, no, How can no. you back off from that? <laughs> no, I can't. That, that's right, I can't. And if I could kill off the ambition, I could retire safely into some little country retreat. But... Uh, I still keep thinking of what I'd like to do and how I'd like to present Heathcliff on stage. That's obviously the biggest thing in my mind at the moment. I'm sure it's going to be a huge success and you've worked extremely hard at it. Oh, it's I've been, been, about it for it's five been years. down and up and down and yes. up and it's now up again. Yes. So come back soon. I'd like to. Uh, we'd love you to be here. Thank you very much indeed. My pleasure. Thank you. We'll take a break. <laughs>